ISO FileMaker Magazine, the professional's resource for FileMaker know-how. Well, hello there and welcome to this video tutorial. My name is Matt Petrowski and I am going to be teaching you more about developing and using FileMaker Pro. In this video, we're taking a look at the topic of automating imports. The content I'll be providing is wonderful if you basically need to move files around on the operating system. And if you need to automate an import, that's what we need to be able to do, move those files. So let's take a look at the file and see what I'm talking about. All right, so the first thing we need is a little bit of context. So bear with me as we take a look at this email that was sent in from a subscriber. Uh, mentioned that they thought that this would be an interesting problem and it is indeed, thank you. So here's the problem. I'm facing a regular download of data from another program. And so we're not talking about connecting here to an API and being able to bring in data. There is a separate program that we have to download from. So far, all seems easy, but I have no control over the directory or folder. So in this case, the file is downloaded to a specific location. In this case, it's downloaded on a Macintosh to this path right here, which as we will see is super long. Volumes, Macintosh hard drive, this is the name of the user, this is the user's specific library. Then we have this folder called containers. Now allow me to pause just a short while and talk about this in the context of the Macintosh. When we are in our library, which is a hidden folder on the Macintosh, and we go into containers, we can see a reverse named um, application here, which is uh, com pelagicnet.driverlog.full. Now I'm assuming the application is called uh, uh, pelagic or pelagic, um, however it's pronounced. This container or anything stored within a container is where FileMaker, or not FileMaker, excuse me, where the Macintosh operating system puts where an application can put things which is considered the sandbox. So you will hear this term sandbox and what this does is this is a private area that only this application can put things. So that's a key thing that we need to understand. Now it's putting it into its data folder, which all applications, whatever those applications are named, and they usually use this reverse naming that I have highlighted here, which is uh, oftentimes a domain name, uh, domain name or the name of the application. They all have a data folder. This, then within that data folder, as we will see, they have a documents folder, and this is where this application is storing its data. Uh, Pelagic or Pelagic, I sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, their exports and then it's a text import. So I'm assuming it's a text import which can be in either a tab delimited or CSV format. It all depends on what that software does. So whenever we're working with software that we don't control, we sort of have to abide by its rules and go to where it puts the data. But what we're going to do is we're going to move the data into a place where we control, where we know what we can do with that data. Um, so it says, uh, searching the folder, the dialog that's open from the import file script. Now here's our next clue right here, import file script. Now there are steps that we have in FileMaker that we can use where we, if we already have context, if we already know that this is our starting point, we can put the user in this starting point and allow them to start to select from there rather than just using the um, standard import file step, which prompts us and puts us in a last known location or a last selected location that FileMaker has used. So we'll fix that one right there. Um, it's not intuitive. We're going to make this process intuitive such that the user maybe doesn't even have to select from here. We just go find the file that we know we need to find. We put it into a location where we can import and we just import. The ideal is to give the user one button to click. They click it and the data just shows up in FileMaker. That's the ideal and that's what we're going to be walking through the rest of this video. So she mentioned, she goes on to mention that she can't find a native way to do this in FileMaker and that she might have to run an Apple script. That's good research on her part. Apple script is available on the Macintosh, but there are many ways to do things. There are also free plugins, which we'll be taking a look at in this video, and we will be solving this problem. So I'm sure you've been able to pause the video and read all of the rest of this if you would like. I won't read it word for word because we are going to get into the solution of solving this problem and we're going to do a little bit of learning outside of FileMaker first, so let's take a look at that. All right, so here we are not in FileMaker. In fact, we are in the terminal. 
Now, if you are using FileMaker Pro, you are on your path to becoming a developer. So be using the terminal is something that you should not be afraid of because Everything in the terminal or everything in the underlying operating system, and this applies both to Macintosh and to Windows, is something that we need to know because we have access to it within FileMaker. Now, whether we're using Apple Script or whether we're using a plugin, we are able to use the tools that are available in the operating system, and this makes things infinitely easier. If we had an operating system that did not allow us to move files around, then what would be the point of folders? We would just have a hard drive with a gigantic list of files. But we have directories and we have files and the operating system is able to move those around. So in the Finder or in Windows, we just visually drag and drop things. But underneath those, underneath that operation of drag and drop, there are tools that are making it happen. So on the Macintosh here, let's take a look at some of them. I'm going to type in this keyword of man. Now man is really, it's short for manual, and most things are short on the command line. And I want you to open up terminal if you're on Macintosh, or if you want, or if you're in, um, I believe it's called Power Builder. Uh, there is a shell, but there's a Power Script, I believe, on Windows. You can always type, uh, I don't know if you can type help. No, uh, we have to go to the manual page. Um, I believe on Windows you can type help. But here I can type man, and then it just comes down to knowing a few of the commands that work with files. And I'm going to list them for you. <clears throat> one of them is MV, another one is CP, and another one is RM. Now, I'm going to let you think about it for just a short bit, but you can think about which one represents what. Did you guess right? Well, MV simply stands for move. CP stands for copy, and RM stands for remove. And those are pretty much all the things that we need to know, at least if another software package is creating things for us. Now, why do we need to know this? It is because we have access to these tools at any point in time, provided our FileMaker database turns on the ability to run AppleScript, as we will be seeing. So if I want to see what the copy or the CP program does, which is what we'll be using, I just enter man space CP. And now I can see that it's quite simply says copy files. Now here's the confusing stuff that most of us early learners really get confused by. Oh my gosh, this is a lot of information. I don't want to read all of this. I don't want to take the time. And really it boils down to the fact that you only need to know a few switches and in some cases, no switches at all. What are switches? Switches, or also known as flags, are these items right here. They're basically just all of the different things that you pass or add on to the command that control or make the command do different things. So as long as you're willing to go into the manual page, do a little bit of reading and look at what does the dash F flag do. Oh, well, it does this. All of the documentation is here for you to use. Now, in this video, we're going to be getting into FileMaker pretty quickly here, but I needed to show you how you can go investigate these things yourself. And by the way, within the man page here, going up and down, you can see what I'm doing is I'm hitting the J and the K keys. So J is taking me down, K is taking me up in order to read, and in order to get out, I can just hit Q. If you wanna read more about navigating through those man pages, then I believe you can type man less, and that will tell you what you can use in terms of keys in order to move through things, because the less command, I believe, is what's used in order to go through all of the manual pages. So, now that I've showed you that, we can now go over into FileMaker and we can take a look at how I've used these underlying operating system tools. And they're on every machine. If you're on Macintosh, CP, MV, and RM, they're there and they're always available to use. In fact, there's a ton of commands. If you do this one command, ls, which uh, let's take a look at that, man ls, list directory contents, if you list a certain directory, then what you will find, such as ls bin, which stands for binaries, I believe, which are basically just all of the things that this computer can run, 
<clears throat> you're going to get a list of applications. Now in there, look, we can see we've got CP, we've got LS, we've got RM right there. Some of these, they're just completely foreign. In fact, I don't know all of these different things. Sleep, um, STTY, well, I do know that. I know test, I know this is another shell. This is a shell. This is symbolic linking. Um, host name gives you the name. Kill kills a process. If you're willing to take the time, you can learn about all of these just by going through a man page and learning. But we're not here for that in this particular video. But it is a wonderful thing to do. So let's head over to the FileMaker file and take a look at the process of how we go about exploring and investigating this problem that we have of getting something from a certain location to another location so that once it's in a fixed known location, we can import it routinely and regularly all the time. All right, so here we are in the file, and what we need to do is we can, there's a few things that we can do in order to make things easier on our user. First off, we know through the letter that we received that we already know the starting point or the location of where things are going to be found, these particular export files from the software Plagic. Now, I've taken the opportunity, I don't have Plagic, but I do have on my machine, I have iBooks and in iBooks there happen to be some folders but you can see that I chose to use library containers and so forth. One of the important things that we're going to learn in this video is that a FileMaker path and an operating system path are slightly different. In fact what the operating system wants in terms of when you pass it a path is going to be different than FileMaker. We can see that because right here we have the name of my hard drive which is boringly Macintosh HD, the users folder which holds all users, the name of the user currently logged in, then my private library, containers, and then as we've already talked about the rest of it is where we're going to find our documents or what is where the problem is, where we're having our data stored. Now we want to move, or in this case, copy a file over to another location, into a known location that we can, within FileMaker, just look at that location and then cause the import to happen. But we need to get the user there first if they need to make the selection, or if they don't need to make the selection, then we just need to know what is the list of files in that location. So let's solve those two problems. The first one is how can we make it easier for the user to make a selection in order to actually get this path or get the selection of what we would want to import? Well, that's going to be a pretty easy one. We go into our scripts and in our scripting workspace on this file, we have a script called get folder path. Now get folder path, I believe has been around since I believe FileMaker 13 or 14. And that's what's going to allow us to give the user a head start or a starting point where they don't have to drill down using the import step, which let's put in the import records. With the import records, when we have the dialog on, that is simply going to ask us for all of the different parts that we want that are right here, such as specify the data source. That's going to come up with our prompt. If this is empty, our prompt comes up. Now what happens is in most software applications, the prompt that comes up is remembered in the preferences of the application that you're using. So FileMaker's preferences file remembers the last location that something was selected from. Could be the desktop, it could be the documents, but it's probably not where we want the user to be. So we need to go ahead and use the information we already have and, yet, and use the get folder path script step. So you can see right here that I have set a initialized a path to nothing. My only reason for doing this is to know that I'm going to be using this variable later on in my script. So this is called an initialization and I'm setting it to nothing. I am turning my error capture on and the reason for that is what happens when the user clicks the cancel button, FileMaker will throw an error and we don't want to see that error so we need to turn on our error capture. Well, I'm going to get my documents path and there's a reason for that. FileMaker's get documents path gives us the name of the hard drive that allows us to remove things off. Also, there's only one location where we are able to get the listing of any contents from any folder. And let me show you that really quickly. I'm going to zoom out here and we'll open up the data viewer, switch over to the watch. Um, 
actually right there, I have one already on there. Let's take a look at this. So here is my documents path. Now FileMaker has one other function as we go into our uh, calculation dialog here and we put in get document path listing. Now this is the only other FileMaker function or the only function in FileMaker that natively allows us to get a listing of all of the contents in a folder. So if you want to work with a file and let's say move between the documents folder and the temporary path or wherever else, this is the only one that you can get access to natively within FileMaker. FileMaker does not have a whole lot of uh, file manipulation. In fact, only recently in FileMaker 18 did we get uh, functions that allow us to get into a file and modify that file and read from it and write to it. Prior to that, this was all we have. Otherwise, we have to use another technology and we've already discovered that it's either going to be AppleScript or a plugin and we will take a look at both of those. So this document path listing, I won't list it right now because it'll list all of my stuff in my private documents folder. But the problem with the get documents path listing is that if you have a lot of documents with a lot of embedded folders, with a lot of subfolders, it will list everything and it's a very costly thing in fact if I listed it here I would get the little uh, rainbow circle of death the little uh, I don't know what they call it the lolly lickable lollipop or whatever and it just takes a long time to list everything out of that aside from that we don't have a function in FileMaker that really allows us to filter really well it's called regular expressions and unfortunately FileMaker has I think of it in terms of FileMaker has refused to put in because I've been asking for it since 1995. But we have no pattern matching methods in FileMaker that allow us to filter out of a long list of things. We have to basically iterate through all of those items using something like our new while or some other function. So having taken a look at the documents folder and knowing that's the only way that we could get a listing of a file it doesn't help us in this situation of what we're trying to solve we know that we're going to a fixed location we know the location but we want to get a list of those files so we're going to have to use Apple script or the plugin but let's take a look at what we've got in terms of our script right here I'll scroll this so that we can zoom it out hopefully it'll show there we go I like to be able to see everything on screen. So we've got our initialized path, nothing. Our documents, not really used, but remember that this path, the documents path, does include our system drive. But we also have a get system drive function which tells us the name of my system drive, such as Macintosh HD. This is necessary because in some cases we need to strip off the Macintosh drive and just do a pure listing. By that, let's head over to the terminal really quickly and take a look at what I'm talking about. So if I am going to do an ls of the users folder right there, notice that I can get a listing and I don't have to include the Macintosh HD. In fact, if I do an ls Macintosh, I can't even uh, get it here, HD, I'll get nothing. I'll get no such directory. On the Macintosh, though, everything with regards to what's mounted on the Macintosh, and this only applies to the Macintosh, on PC, you've got drive designations via a letter, C, E, D, F. So it's a little bit different. They use the backslash, but within FileMaker, they still use the forward slash. So if I do an LS of this magical directory called volumes these are all of the mounted drives that are on my current computer and you can see that I've got a drive called data Mac backup keys internal reflection and Macintosh HD so there is my Macintosh right there in fact that uh, red probably indicates that that is my root or boot drive so if I do an LS volumes Macintosh HD and you can see that what's happening here this is very important on the uh, command line this space in commands in the operating system both on Windows and on uh, Macintosh I believe I, I bl I'm saying I believe because of the Windows side spaces are designators as a separator between options between these flags or these switches as I've called them 
Therefore, you have to protect things in terms of spaces. So there's two ways to do this. You can either back slash escape a space or you can use um, single quotes. So this single quotes will also protect this. So if this backslash was not here, I'll need to move over to it, that itself should work right there where I will get a listing of all of the different contents of my root hard drive. So this is another key thing that we need to know when we're going to be using that magic CP command when we're doing it using Apple script within the uh, within FileMaker. So let's head back over to our FileMaker script. So here's our solution. We can grab a path and put it into a folder such that if we want to use that path, if we want to let the user directly select on the thing in that embedded containers folder, we can do that by simply supplying right here. Now you can see what I did is I took the opportunity using the documents path to strip off the documents part. In other words, I'm able to build up my path such that I get the user name. The reason that we do this is we get the documents path and we use the parts of the document path because on each and every different computer, it's very likely that we will have a different username. We can't put the absolute path in here of slash users slash Matt because your computer, you do not log in as Matt. You log in as something else. So what we're doing is we're using two pieces of information. Our first piece of information is we can use the doc, FileMaker's documents function, which will get me the name of the hard drive, the user's folder, and the name of the user. Then we can combine that together with what we know is underneath that user's folder, which is going to be library, then containers, then the path to our file, then data, and so forth. I just need to take off the word documents from what this particular function right here returns. So it's an easy solution right there. So once we show the get folder path, what's going to happen when we run this script? And finally, what we're going to do at the end is we're going to set that into our uh, folder. I can stop it at whatever point I want, but we can see when I run this, this puts me right into the hierarchy that I want to be within. I'm on my hard drive, I'm on my user, or in the users, on the correct user, in the hidden library folder, in the containers, right where the user needs to be. And I don't have to teach them how to do this. So I've solved the problem by knowing two different pieces of the puzzle, that I can use the documents to get the first part of the path, and then I can use the remaining part of the path to combine those two to allow the user to choose the file that they want for import. Then all I have to do within my import, because, and here's the, the time when I'm going to click cancel that set error capture. We want that on there. You can see it took my path away. Well, if I wanted to use this as my stopping point for my solution to this problem, I could very easily just say, after I get folder path, I can use this variable of path in my import step. So I just go over to import. I'm going to import my records. I'm going to turn the dialog off if it's a, if I'm, always doing a fixed field match. And then my specify my data source is simply just going to be use my path because that is going to be the path to the, to the file that the user had chosen. Easy peasy. So that is our first potential solution, but it still does require user interaction. So let me go ahead and select this, put my path back in here, and we will move on to the next part of this problem, and that is automating it even further by moving the file from this location that we have right here into another known location where we can copy it, and actually, or excuse me, where we can import it. Actually, I messed up there. I don't mean to say move. We can do either or. We can move a file or we can copy a file. Uh, why might it be best to do one over the other? Well, once you move the file, if something happens to it, you don't have the original. So the best course of action is usually to copy the file, import it, then based on the results of that import, if it's successful, then you can go back and you can delete that file if you no longer need it. That's a much better process than just moving it, hoping that it works out successfully, not having a, an original you can go back to, and then just messing things up. So we will take a look at that as we go on to these next steps. So let me just run this again. 
and I am going to, um, I am on the right place. Yes, I am. I want this documents folder. There we go. I want the documents folder, I believe is what I want. Let me run that again and select documents. Documents, select, and it puts that right there in the field. Now that I've saved this path, I can use this path for the rest of my operations, no matter what I'm doing. And let's take a look at that next. All right, so let's now move the problem forward and let's try to solve the problem where we don't even have the user select the file. In fact, we know what the file is typically going to be in terms of an export, or we could look at the fact of when I get a listing of all of the files that are in the expected folder where I expect them, maybe I could just take the most recent one based on its creation date because the user just clicked in, uh, export in the other software and then they came right over to FileMaker. You can do whatever you want to do as long as you're willing to look at those flags under uh, say man space ls. You're able to list things in an order such that the most recently created file would be at the top or at the bottom. You get to control. So. There's going to be two ways that we're solving this. I already mentioned this. One is through AppleScript and another one is through a plugin. If you're going to use AppleScript, you're going to have to do this. We go up to File, we go to our Manage, and we go to Security. Once we look at the privilege set that the user is using, I'm on a full access privilege set. When I select this and click on the little icon right here to edit, and this is FileMaker 18, this option right here must be checked if you're going to allow the use of AppleScript. Now here's what I have to say about this. If you do turn on AppleScript and the user knows that AppleScript is turned on, they can do nefarious things. They can go in and get a listing of all the fields or a listing of all of the tables or a listing of all of the scripts and then arbitrarily play and just try to trigger and run those scripts via AppleScript. So that's a real bummer. but. How would, we how would we address that? Well, what you do typically in this is what's called privilege escalation. What you do is the user typically works within a privilege set where that privilege set does not have this checkbox checked. But you create a separate privilege set that does have the privilege set checked. And what you do is within the script, you log the user into a separate a uh, higher level of access with that privilege set with allow Apple events turned on. And then after the script runs down, you de-escalate their uh, privilege set by logging them out of that account and back into their own. Now, unfortunately, that is a bit of a hassle to do. The alternative is to not use Apple script and use a plugin. And that's what we're going to take a look at both of these. Now I want you to learn about the Apple script because it's really useful here on the Macintosh. Unfortunately on Windows we don't have anything. You have the plugin, but on Windows you also have the same thing that I'm showing here about Macintosh and that is access to underlying operating system tools such as being able to move things, uh, move files and so forth. And the plugin will allow you to do that, the plugin that I'm going to show. So with the Apple script part turned on, let's take a look at the Apple script method. But before we do that, we need to be able to see things when we move one file uh, or a file from one location to another location. Now there's a one fixed location in FileMaker that we are always going to be able to count on being available to every user no matter what. It's sort of like the free access park or playground where anybody and everybody can come. Otherwise, the rest of what's going on in our operating system or in our computers is can be locked down according to permissions. So this area, this sandbox private, not private, but public area is called the temporary folder. So as I bring up the data viewer, here's what I want you to do. I want you to create a variable and then I want you to go to this and type in get temporary path. Now what that's going to do is it's going to show you <clears throat> according to a FileMaker path, the path or the place where FileMaker as software can put any file that it wants to put. Now again, remember a FileMaker path isn't always exactly what an operating system path is in terms of what it wants. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy everything here from the var all the way up to this S10 and it's always S10. Now I'm going to switch over to my terminal 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in a command that says open. And then I'm going to paste that in all of that var what have you. I'm going to hit return and what you're going to see is that a folder is going to open for me. Now yours will not have this technique database. This is a folder that I created in an, that I create in another FileMaker file that I use in order to manage my techniques. This folder called S10 will be empty. I'll hide my sidebar there so that we're not distracted. So in order to automate our imports, our goal is to get things, and let's go ahead and monitor that, close our data viewer, and switch over to FileMaker. But our goal is to get a target export from this location over to the temporary folder because we know that in FileMaker we can import from that location. Now your question upcoming maybe, well why can't I import the file directly from this folder? You can. You certainly can just perform an import right from this folder if you wanted to, if you know the name of the file. But we're trying to automate this so we need to get a listing of all of the files. So first, let's go over to this folder by selecting all of this right here and doing the same thing we just did in the terminal. We'll go over to this and I'm going to type again, open, and I'm going to paste in the path that I want to open. And there it is right there. So we have two folders on our screen right now. Side by side, we have our folder where we have a listing of some files, and I'm going to pretend that one of these files is a file that I uh, want to move from one place into another place, and I want to do that within FileMaker so that the user just clicks the button. So I am going to do a, a little magic here. CD simply means, for, uh, me, uh, means change directory. So I have now moved into this particular folder that we see right here. Let me see if I can move this right there so that you can see what's going to happen. Now this is another command that you don't have to know this. It isn't specific to this command, but I'm going to uh, create a file. And it turns out that creating a file can be done in multiple ways, but in this case I'm using a, f a command called touch. So I'm going to call this sumfile.txt and that's going to represent my file that was exported from the software. Now as I do that, you saw that what appeared probably right above my head, or unless my head's blocking it, some file right there. So there is a zero bytes file. And we'll talk about what goes on with these two files. So here in my finder, I've got my two folders. And I've got my terminal in between. I want to move this file, or excuse me, I keep saying move. I want to copy this file from this location over to this location with a rename. Now the reason that I want to rename the file is that in my FileMaker script I can pretty much anticipate that maybe there's a file that's always exported the same. But in the original text that I got from Terry, she mentioned that the file could be different or it could change by name. So what that means is that I either need to be able to get a listing and see that this file was created today and put it up at the top just like we have right here where I can click on this sort header. You can do the same thing within the ls command. Or I need to be able to basically rely on the fact that it's always the exact same named file. Well, the cp command allows us to do two things at once. It allows us to both copy the file, but also rename it as part of the process. So watch this. We're going to do this in the command line so that we understand what AppleScript's doing when we put this into FileMaker. So I am going to type cp, which means I want to copy a file from and to. And it looks just like this. Copy whatever file from a location to a location. You need to include the name of the file. What I'm going to do here on the Mac, it's a wonderful thing. You can drag uh, files directly in here. So I'm going to copy it from this location. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of cheat a little bit here and use this uh, technique database folder and then I'm going to remove that technique database right there. And then we will read what this says. And unfortunately, it's a little bit long. I'll highlight it so that we can see what's going on. I want to copy from the absolute path according to the operating system. Notice that we don't have volumes or Macintosh on here, but I want to copy this text file to this location. Now, if I just left this empty as is, the command has to assume that some file name has to be given. So it would use the same file name. 
But if I specify a file name, then I get the opportunity to rename this. So I can call this something like import.tab. Now we saw in the original email that it goes into a folder called dot t or slash txt, but it could be a CSV, it could be a tab, whatever. By renaming a file with a different extension, you get to control how files are seen. So FileMaker will see a dot tab file as a tab delimited file and import as a tab delimited file. If I put in CSV, Regardless of the fact that this is a .txt file, I can say this is actually the data within the file is in a comma separated format. And that's what FileMaker will see. It will see the file as a CSV file and then import accordingly. So I'll put in .tab and we will see what happens as I zoom out. So I should, when I execute this command, get a file that is some file should stay here and then a new copy will be over here but with a different name. So let's run that and there it is. It's almost instantaneously. There is my file import.tab. It would have the same contents. Everything would be great. So now let's take a look at doing that within FileMaker using AppleScript first and then the plugin. All right, so now let's make the magic happen within FileMaker. There are many ways to solve a problem. I, there are so many different ways that I could have solved this problem, but I'm showing you one of the easiest to do. I could have used 100% native Apple script, but that would have been probably a 15 to 20 line Apple script when I can accomplish all of that with one command within the terminal. It turns out that Apple script allows us to run a shell command. So when we go into our manage scripts and we zoom in here, what we're going to see that I've got copy file Apple script and I've got copy file plugin. Now they're going to differ in size. You can see that the, the plugin is shorter, but the Apple script is something that's wonderful for us to know. The reason that I'm showing you is because knowing how to use the underlying operating system tools is extremely helpful. You can use those either through Apple script or through a plugin. Now, after that, we'll talk about getting a listing of the files and you will have all the pieces to the puzzle. You will know that if I can get a listing of the files, put that into FileMaker, I can then choose from the listing of files and then do whatever I want. But that's gonna be a little bit more, uh, there's a little bit more that goes on in terms of that process. We're just gonna emulate what we did in the command line here with AppleScript. So here's what we do. The first thing we do is we need to get the temporary path. We've already looked at that, it's super easy. We are going to modify that temporary path because the temporary path stops at a folder. We now need to say what's the name that we want. Well, in this case, I'm appending the name right there with import.tab. Also notice that in this script, I have everything hard coded. I don't have any inbound parameters that I've specified in the naming of this script, but I could use a script parameter and pass the target file as an inbound parameter, knowing that I'm moving that to a location and renaming it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the file is going to come from the path that I had that the user chose, and the file is some underscore file.txt. Now again, if you're following this video and you want to emulate the same thing on your machine, you're going to have to create that same file that I did. You can use the touch command or you can create the file with a right click, however you create it, it just needs to be there. Now, remember, there are differences between a FileMaker path and an operating system path. In the operating system, in AppleScript, we're able to use the complete path, the absolute path, which starts with volumes, goes to Macintosh HD, the name of the system, so on, down the chain, everything we've learned, and that's what we need to do. So what I've done here is I've created a variable named set variable, which is the command that I'm going to have Apple script run. So if we take a look at this particular one, it's pretty easy. Remember, let's go into our dialog box. Remember the CP command at its simplest form is CP, the from file to file. That's it, two simple things, that and that. Now FileMaker is going to, we already have a path that's a FileMaker path, and we already have a target, which is our temporary folder. 
right there. That's the combination. The target is our uh, combination. I can't see it right now in my scripts, but it's a combination of the temporary path and the import.tab. This function called OS path is simply converting a FileMaker path into a path that the operating system will like, or something that they actually call the POSIX path. So you can look that up if you want to, but I didn't want to confuse you with <clears throat> the naming and so forth. It's just an operating system path is how I think of it. So we have made a command here. Now notice that I have the little special thing that I told you at the very beginning of this video, video that in order to protect this in the event that the name of my file or some of the folders in between, if they have spaces, which is illegal in a command or will be interpreted, not illegal, they will be interpreted as options or switches, flags, options, switches, flags are all synonymous. I'm going to protect that with my single quotes. So I have a CP with a single quote protected string of a path with another single quote protected path. And that's what we're concatenating here. Once I've created that command, all I have to do is put it into a format that Apple script likes. So here is my Apple script and it comes down to something as simple as this. I'm going to have my command, which is right there, but Apple script within FileMaker, <coughs> Apple script most typically you have to tell an application to do something. So typically what you have is tell application FileMaker do this, then tell application finder do this, tell this application to do that. Well, when an application is going to reference itself, you can use tell me. So this is just an Apple strip construct that basically says FileMaker, tell yourself running Apple script to do this shell script. In other words, do the same thing that you would do if you had opened up the terminal and you had just run that command. Now there's one thing you need to be aware of. In fact, I didn't do it here. This is a nuance that deals with shell scripting. Every time that a shell script is invoked, if it's invoked by an application and that application doesn't have the same settings that you have when you literally open this window, this window is called a session, it's my terminal, and it has an environment the variables might be different. So many times what you want to do is you want to do what's called a full reference to the binary. Now you'll notice that I simply put in a CP of from and to. That will work here in the terminal and it will work in this particular instance with FileMaker, but there are some cases where when you run something, the subshell that's what, what is run doesn't know where an application is. So many times you have to give it the absolute path. So the absolute path in this case is slash, which is the root, bin, which is the, the folder for binaries, and then CP, which is the application. So that means over in FileMaker, what I should have done is I should have done this right here. I should have slash bin slash CP in order to be absolutely correct even though this one will work. So I actually like that I found that uh, error here and I was able to show you. So with that command, we now put that into Apple script. By having it in a variable, I'm able to see what the Apple script is going to be. And then finally, I'm going to perform the Apple script. Now, as a result, most of the time when you run these types of operations, they're sort of what's called blind. You don't necessarily know that you successfully got the file over there. So you want to check that the file is over there. That's where using FileMaker 18 or higher, you can see that we have a get file exists. This is where we're able to say, look at the target, make sure that it happened. If it did, then we're going to get a successful one. So let's run this script now. And as, as you've noticed, we should see some file moved over to or copied over to here with that uh, new name. So let's run our script in the debugger. I invoked that and we'll also show the data viewer so that we can see everything that's going on because we love to do that as FileMaker developers. We'll scroll down to the bottom here so we can see our variables and we will step through. So temporary, we got that. There's our temporary path. 
we got our target. You can see right here, if we look at temporary, there is no file. That's all right. It was added onto the target right there, import.tab. We set our file and we set our command. So let's take a look at our command. Our command is this long thing. And this is all behind the scenes, all the software you use. This is what's going on, this type of stuff. It's just the stuff that confuses people. It's long and it looks cryptic and it's got all kinds of weird characters in it, but this is what's going on behind the scenes. It's what FileMaker does. It's what pretty much all kinds of things do. I mean, they have access to functions and they're able to move things without using the operating system, but there are other software applications that they do directly use the operating system, like we are here. So we are copying our protected... There's our space right there between our commands, and there's our next command right there. Looks like everything should successfully work when we run the Apple script. We run our next step, take a look at our Apple script. There all we did is we stuck the command into quotes, and then we are going to do the shell script. One thing you need to remember is if in your command, if you ever do have double quotes, you have to protect those or escape them within FileMaker. But when we're using single quotes, which I always suggest, then we're not really worried. And we see okay. So at this point, when we perform this Apple script, given that our permissions are turned on for FileMaker, we're going to get this to make that file over there. And there it is right there, import.tab. So we have now solved the problem. We are able to get the file from a location that we know where the file potentially exists, into a location where we know that we can reference with a name that we know we can rely on each and every time for a reliable import. The only thing we need to learn now is how do we get a listing of all of these files in order to choose the one that we want because it may not be named some file. It may be named something else. Maybe it's named with a date. There's almost always a pattern and you just need to be able to pull that file out. We are going to do that with Apple Script, with commands yet again, and we'll also do it with the plugin. But before we do that, let's take a quick look at how easy the plugin is and talk about it. All right, so let's talk about briefly what you have available as alternatives to Apple Script. Obviously on the Macintosh here, Apple Script is here. On Windows, you have access to PowerShell. I believe you can call that uh, within a script using the, um, I forget what it is. Let's zoom in here and see if I can execute uh, it's not apple events it might be i'll see apple script i forget where it, what the name of it is um i'll have to uh, think about that and put that on the screen of what the function is that's a somewhat equivalent to uh apple script um, actually what it is on Windows is you're able to call batch scripts or you're able to call a PowerShell script and have that run. And as long as the user has permissions, you're able to do everything that we're talking about here in the Macintosh on Windows as well. If you can write the script, then the script will do what you want. So just copying files, you're good to go. So let's take a look. I'll close this and not save that. Let's take a look at the process of a plugin now. And in this particular case, what I chose to use was there is a freely available plugin. In fact, I'll bring up my preferences and we'll take a look at my plugins. These are the plugins that I use. Um, the Base Elements plugin is freely available and has file manipulation tools built within. The problem with using a plugin is that for every machine where that export needs to be imported, they have to have a copy of this plugin. The upside is you can automatically install a FileMaker plugin. However, I always suggest that this is unchecked. So if allow solutions to install files is not checked, then a plugin will not be able to be installed. So you have to go through an initial process. And if you have a lot of users, that becomes a bit of a hassle. Otherwise, the best solution is if the export happens, let's say on FileMaker server, then you can install the plugin once there and it'll work for everybody. But if you have multiple users using the same software, doing multiple exports and needing to get the data into local copies of FileMaker or hosted copies of FileMaker, you just have to install the plugin. Uh, BBox will move files. MBS plugin will move files. This is a wonderful plugin, but it is a paid plugin. And Scriptmaster using uh, Java, actually Groovy, a, a variant or flavor of Java will work as well. And this is a free plugin. Uh, this one is free and very hard. This one is free and it's much easier. This one is free and 
you have many different options. It's harder. And this one is paid, but well worth it. These are the plugins that I run on a regular basis. So let's take a look <clears throat> at the process of the plugin and see how much easier it is. We get our temporary. We get our name. We get our path that we already grabbed from the get folder. And then we just run the command, be file copy. And that's it. So you can see we have a lot fewer steps because we don't have to build the command, we don't have to build the Apple script and then execute the Apple script. Here we just copy the from file to the target file and that's it. We either have a result or we don't. So that's what we see here as a result of our exit script. This uh, script is going to return the result of the copy was either successful or it was not. If it was not successful, what's returned by be file copy, which is the base elements, is a question mark. And so we return zero which matches the same thing as get file exists. Otherwise, what we do as a result is, it turns out that the base elements, if no problems happened, you get a zero back. So in order to convert that zero into a positive one, which matches the uh, get file exists function, which returns a, run, a one successful if it does exist, I'm flipping the result there. I'm flipping it from a zero to a one. So if it's a zero, I get a one. And that's all there is to the plugin. That's pretty much it. I've got the documentation here. And you will also find that when you click on documentation here, it will load the base elements plugin help. And you're able to look at all of the different functions that they have. Um, there we go. File and folder manipulation. We've got field contents, file copy, file deletes, file exists, import, file list folder, etc. And all of these are really helpful from a plugin standpoint because they all exist existed before FileMaker versions which have added this particular functionality. If you don't have FileMaker 18, then you're going to be able to do a lot more with the base elements plugin or one of the other plugins than with FileMaker natively, unless you're willing to use AppleScript. So let's take a look at one final part of the puzzle, and that is if I want to get a listing of all of the files from this folder and then be able to determine from that listing which one I want and simply add that file to my path, then that's what I want to be able to do. That's the last part of our problem and then the import is up to you. So let's take a look at that and then we will wrap this video up. And here comes the final part to this video. It's the final piece to the whole puzzle to automating all of this. We need to be able to get a listing of the contents of our folder. Now, as I switch over to the terminal, and I'm already in the folder that I want to be, which by the way, you can always see what folder you're in. If your particular terminal does not list the folder that you're in, there is a command and it's called PWD. Again, everything's shorthand, but it stands for Print Working Directory. And that's how I remember it. So PWD will list the folder or identify the folder that you are in, which you can then copy and actually go over to FileMaker or do whatever you want with it. But what I am looking for here is a list of files. Now, as I told you, the ls command, if I was to use man ls, I would be able to see all of the different flags that I'm able to pass to ls. But if I do an ls, and I just happen to know these flags, dash l h a is basically going to say <coughs> list um, all, and I forget what the h stands for. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a listing which is more information than I need, or maybe not. Remember, because we're able to run our command in FileMaker using AppleScript or using the plugin, I have access to any and all of this information. In other words, I can take all of this, which I know means nothing to you if you haven't worked with the command line, but I'll give you an idea. D at the very beginning means directory dash means that it's a file. Then we have three sets of permissions, which is <clears throat> user, group, and then world or everyone else. And you have read, write, and execute. Read, write, and execute. Read, write, and execute. Here is my user, Matt, which matches these permissions right there. Here is my group, staff, which could have multiple users which matches those permissions there. And then this is pretty much everybody. The A, which means there are attributes on this file, which I could use another command in order to find information, what have you. 
This is the size of the file, how many bytes, and this is the modification date. If I want all of that information in FileMaker, I can certainly bring it into FileMaker. If I only want the name of the file, then I can bring that in as well. So let's take a look at how I'm doing this in FileMaker using that command of ls-lha. What you're going to see is that as I clear this, <clears throat> and I'll type in clear, which is off screen there, there is this whole world in uh, command line scripting, which is wonderful actually, called piping. Um, so let's take a look at what piping means here in the terminal before we head over into FileMaker and see that we can do the same thing in FileMaker. ls-lha is going to give me a listing of everything that is in here. If, for example, I only want to see the files, what was the distinction between a directory versus a file. Do you remember? It was the difference between a D in front of the permissions or a dash. So here's where piping comes into play and you can do pipe after pipe after pipe. It's basically like a long chain of friends. If you're a good attorney and you happen to know a good plumber and that good plumber happens to know somebody that is a good landscaper, that is a chain if all of those people happen to need something from each of the people in all of the different collection of people. So in this, if I need a listing, but I need to go to another application that does something really well, such as filtering things out, I can do that. And it's an application called grep. This is also known as regular expressions. It's what I wish FileMaker had built in internally. What I can do is without boring you without the details because learning regular expressions, I highly suggest it, but it is confusing. I am simply saying at the beginning, I want you to give me everything that has a dash and a dash only, meaning ignore all of the things that are a directory. And lo and behold, what I get as a listing, and let's just do the other so that we can compare. Rather than getting everything inclusive of all of the directories, what I got instead was just a listing of the files. And that's exactly what I want to know. I don't need to know about the directories because I'm not going to import a directory. I'm only going to import a file. So this piping is really cool on the command line and you get the benefits all within FileMaker. Heading over to FileMaker, we can take a look of get directory files with the uh, Apple script or get directory files with a plugin. Now here you can see that it's super simple. All I've done is one thing. I am setting a variable to the Apple script that I want to run and then I'm running the Apple script. And provided everything is how it should be, that will be returned into my field if I want to. <clears throat> so let's take a look at that. Here is the Apple script. We'll go into the calculation itself and we will talk about this. Let's hide that. That makes it really nice so that I can zoom in and we can see what's going on as I scroll over the side. All right, so here what I've done is rather than creating multiple set variable steps, building as we go so that I can teach you and show you everything, I've just shoved it all into one let function, which oftentimes I find to be easier. It just depends on the read how you like the readability of your code. So we go let. I know I'm going to need a path. What is that path going to be? Well, it's going to be the path that I have in the path field, which the user already used the uh, get folder. I'm going to substitute out the system drive with a slash. And that's because I don't need the full path. I need an operating system path as if I was to type it. And if I was going to type it, Macintosh, .8, uh, Macintosh space HD, in my case, not needed. So I need to get rid of it. So that path is going to be injected into my Apple script. And let's take a look at that. FileMaker is going to tell itself through Apple script, tell me to, in this case, we have a little bit of a difference, set the result. So we are capturing the result of our uh, shell script into an Apple script variable called result. A little bit confusing, but that's how it's working. We're telling FileMaker to tell itself to do the shell script. Here's my full path to my binary tool, bin slash ls dash l. I'm getting a listing of that. I don't need the a for the all, which shows me my uh, parent directories or the dots or hidden full, uh, files. <clears throat> and I don't need the h. 
but I am going to escape with my single quotes, my path that protects it from if it has spaces. I am piping that to grep and I'm taking all of my files and then I'm piping that to this particular command called awk. And there's all these tools that we have available to us in the operating system. If you take the time to learn awk and sed, there's tons of stuff you can do. I mean, it's limitless what you can do with files and folders underneath on the operating system, given that FileMaker can execute these using AppleScript or a plugin. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm printing the ninth item out of a list. In fact, if we want to take a look at this, we can go look at this in the terminal. It's really fun to do. Let's go ahead and switch over to the terminal really quickly. Let's do a clear on this. Let's get to our LHA grep and let's pipe it to that awk. Now, in this case, what it's going to do um, is it's just going to give me the names of the files. <clears throat> now, if I wanted these in a sorted order, all I have to do is take a look at the manual documentation for LS and you will find a flag or a switch that allows you to sort these files in the order of their creation or modification date, thereby knowing that the file that is either first or last is the most recently created file. So if you know that the user had just exported within that external software, you can get that file to be up at the top or the bottom, and then you can verify based on the name or what have you, whatever you want to do. But if we run this command and just look at it without the awk, we can count the nine different steps or the nine different things. So we've probably got one, uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then this would be nine. So actually this is, this is factoring as one. So it's using these tabs probably as the separators. And it sees this as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's all the time, eight, and then nine right here. So if I was to put in awk print number eight, I would get the time. If I was to put in print awk, uh, you know, whichever this one is, play with those these commands in the terminal if you want to see the difference because it's really cool to know that out of a listing of anything you can pull any individual part and get whatever you want so in this case i am able to within filemaker tell it i want you to do this shell script i want you to capture the result into a filemaker into a apple script variable named result after you run that, I want you to run another command, which is, or another AppleScript command that says, tell me, and this is FileMaker specific functions, set field named result, because I have a field, it's a global field named result, to the AppleScript variable of result. And that's exactly what happens. So as we watch this, it's really pretty cool to see that within one, well, let's call it two, but within two script steps, I'm able to go out to the operating system, run a command as if I had opened the terminal and get those results right into a FileMaker field. Then from there, I get to decide whatever I want to do. Take the top value, take the bottom value, filter them, use any of your FileMaker calculation logic to do whatever you want to do. So right here within result, we are going to take a look as I run this script with the debugger. <clears throat> We'll run it off to the side. We will set our variable as long as our path is correct, which in this case we know it is. The very next thing, perform Apple script, is going to dump those files right into my FileMaker field. And I now get to choose which one I want to combine, some file.txt, with my path, and then run the copy of the file or do whatever I want. I could import directly from it. If I knew that this was the file and that's all I needed, I don't need to move the file. I can import directly from this location by being able to grab the listing of files that are in the location that I know where they should be. And this is the cool stuff that is being able to take full control of your destiny within FileMaker doing things with other software applications. So let's take a look at this one little bit, a few more steps, but again, it's really pretty simple. We have to convert our FileMaker path stored in our field to a operating system specific path that includes the word volumes, the word uh, Macintosh, HD, what have you. And here is the, the plugin function, BE file list folder. Here's the path. 
Now just set the field to the results that you want. So if I go over here and you are going to see a, a bit of a difference. Um, I'll go ahead and take the time to explain it. Here you can see that I've got one, two, three, four, five files. If I clear this out and I go run the uh, plugin version and run that one, you're going to see that it has many more. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's got one more file and it actually turns out that it's not actually a quote unquote file. So if you're looking for the edification, I will tell you, I will show you the uh, what it is finding versus what my Apple script is find, finding. Because all we need to do is an LSLHA and talk about these. Uh, we can see right here on screen that it is finding this particular quote unquote file <clears throat> called iChats. We can see that this particular file, instead of having a D or a dash in front of it, has an L. Now, if you are familiar with uh, shortcuts in Windows or um, I forget what they're called, aliases in the Macintosh, this is simply a pointer to another file. Well, again, for your edification, in an operating system, anything that is not a directory is call, considered a file. Whether that is a placeholder that's pointing to another location, even if the location is a folder or a file, that is still considered a file. So this is what's called a symbolic link and it's identified by the L at the beginning of the listing here. And so because the OS sees that as a file and it is not explicitly filtering out only those files that start with a dash like I was with grep, in this particular case, the plugin is returning this because it is a legitimate file even though it's not the type of file that we would import because it would never work. This is simply pointing to the iChats folder, which is many directories up from it in a documents folder somewhere else. In fact, we would be able to copy that path and go to it if we wanted to, to see what this is actually referenced. But that is the case of what the difference here between what the plugin is finding with the inclusion of the iChats versus not finding the iChats. Also notice that the order in which the files are returned. When you use the plugin, you do not have any information about the files that we have, like we have control when we use AppleScript. When we use AppleScript and the ls command, we can control the sorting order. We're saying what order we're going to get that data back in. However, with the plugin, you have to use other functions in order to make determinations about files. So once I have the name of this file, I could then use further functions in order to investigate the file, even get its contents if I wanted to. And of course, with FileMaker 18 and higher, you can also take that file and grab its contents and get those right into FileMaker and inspect them before you ever do an import. In fact, this is something that I've done in many of my other solutions. It's a good idea. You can grab the first X number of bytes of a file. Let's say you're only going to grab 100 bytes. It's a one megabyte file, or let's be even more drastic. Let's say it's a one gigabyte file. Well, before you start an import, and especially if that file is not in the format that you want, if it's maybe they had changed the import format, you're typically looking for headers at the top of a comma separated or a tab delimited file so that you can maybe do field matching, or maybe you don't have the headers. But if the headers are there, you can use FileMaker in FileMaker 18, its functions, or plugin functions, or Apple Script and the command line, again, there's multiple ways to solve things, to take only the first 100 or so bytes. That will usually give you all of the information about all of the fields that are identified as the headers, at least on a comma separated uh, file. And that's a great way to determine whether or not you should proceed. And in all of these scripts, <clears throat> you will see that the way that I have set these scripts up, such as copy file AS, copy file with the plugin, you can see at the end of every one of these scripts, I am returning a text result. And when you're working with files, this is a very procedural thing. Multiple things have to be in the right place in order for things to, go, uh, to happen successfully. So you test all along the way. First off, you find out whether the file exists that you want to copy. If it does exist, then you copy. 
as a result of that copy, you find out if the copy was successful. If the copy was successful, then you can go on to look at the file. If you take the first few hundred bytes off of the top of the file, you can look at those and see if the headers match what you're expecting before you do the import. If that's successful, then you can finally call the import, and if the import's successful, then your whole script is a success and you've done what you needed to do. That is the way that you typically program a solution because if you don't, if you're not constantly testing and error handling along the way, what happens is you get scripts, they don't work, and then your users call you up and they say, this isn't working, and then you have to figure out, okay, can you give me more information about what you did, why it's not working, so forth, and so on. Those are called bugs. <laughs> so. I hope this video has helped you out with regards to a better understanding of the operating system, how we can tap into that, and how we can automate any type of import that we want to in terms of doing it within FileMaker. As always, I'd like to wish you much luck with your own FileMaker development, and until next time, happy FileMaking. We hope you've enjoyed this video tutorial, and we'd like to say thank you for your subscription and your support. If you're not already a subscriber, head on over to www.filemakermagazine.com slash subscribe for more information about the benefits of joining.